everybody. Uh, welcome to Doc, Sorry Didn't Happen. Um, this is a talk that I've given a few times in the last few years, and I like to take it to open source conferences uh, to share some things that are happening in the documentation world in an open source context. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm really glad that uh, they invited me to give this talk. It's the first time I'm in Gothenburg, and it's really pretty. The weather is really nice, so and the people are great. So uh, why are we here? Here as in in this room, this is not an existential question. Uh, why are we in this talk? Um, and so I'm hoping, I'm going to make certain assumptions as we go forward, uh, that we want to have more users and contributors to our open source projects. We want to increase adoption, right? Adoption is the name of the game. Uh, we believe, or we want to believe, that documentation can help us. Uh, but something is stopping us. Uh, for some reason or another, uh, we are uh, struggling with improving our documentation. We maybe don't know how. Uh, we might have some limitations. Um, and I'm just going to give you a couple of housekeeping uh, notes. I would appreciate if we kept any kind of flame wars around technology at the door. Uh, one of the great things I love about uh, working in the documentation field is that I get to interact with a lot of different types of technology, a lot of programming languages, uh, and I love it all. I love it all. It's all great, and um, I love the things that are happening in the open source world. And uh, the other thing I'm going to mention is that this talk is about 45 minutes, and I do not do un on stage questions. So I will be hanging out at the Red Hat booth most of the time or nearby. You could probably recognize me from here. Come and find me and ask me questions. I also do consulting for open source projects. So if you have something specific you want to ask me about, then I'm happy to, uh, to help you out. I'll be here today and tomorrow until a little bit after lunch time. Um, so who am I? Who is this person with the crazy hair talking to you? Uh, my name is Mikey Ariel. I am from Israel, but I live in Prague uh, for the last uh, three years. I work at Red Hat. Uh, I'm a technical writer for OpenStack Platform, which means I read a lot of Python, and I don't really know what it does, but somehow it works. Uh, and I used to work in OpenShift uh, and also in the JBoss uh, space. I've been a technical writer for 10 years now, and I've been working in open source for about five years at Red Hat. Uh, I'm a recovering Scrum Master, and I still love Agile and DevOps. Um, I'm also on the core team of Write the Docs, and if that reminds you of Read the Docs, is because it was started by the same people. So Eric Holscher is the co-founder, uh, and I'm one of the four people who manage the global community. I'll tell you a little bit ab about it later. Uh, I was also the participant in the first Django Girls workshop, and I ran a few of those workshops. I organized workshops. Uh, I'm very much in touch with the Python and Django communities. I'm a member of the Django Software Foundation. And tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to take a train to Copenhagen and go to DjangoCon Europe. So this is my little Scandinavian conference tour. Um, I contribute to Fedora. Uh, I've also done coaching and consulting for open source projects like KDE, uh, NixOS, uh, Plone, uh, all sorts of things. And I'm half of the team that runs happiness packets, which has nothing to do with technology and everything to do with being nice to human beings. So you can look it up, happinesspackets.io. There are also stickers for Write the Docs and for Happiness Packets at the Red Hat booth, so you're welcome to have them. Um, and what are we going to talk about today? So docs already didn't happen, right? Like it's a really nice catchy phrase. Uh, but there are a few things, there are three parts of this talk that I would like to go over. Um, first part is content strategy, is what we write, how we write it, when do we want to write it. Um, when you plan a little bit, you can save a lot of time, aggravation, you know, effort. Uh, so we want to be able to plan things ahead. Uh, I know sometimes it's fun to just jump in there and code some things, right? But if you want to have your project, you know, scale and be sustainable, you should be planning your documentation as well. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is DevOps for docs, and DevOps is subject that's very close to my heart. It's all about tooling integration and process workflows and automation. Uh, and then the third part is about the community spirit because it's not just about the tools. It's very rarely actually about the tools, right? So we are surrounded by humans working together and how, how we can improve um, our collaboration around this. So I would like to invite you all to the Documentarian Club. What is the Documentarian Club? What is a documentarian? So uh, about five years, six years ago, Write the Docs is a documentation-focused community built on open source principles. So it was started by the folks from Read the Docs, people from Django, people from Python, and it was all about holistic approach to all kinds of development around the software industry. Right? So a documentarian is someone who cares 
about documentation and communication in the software industry, regardless of job title. So it doesn't matter whether you're a developer, a technical writer, support engineer, community manager, DevOps, everybody has something that they want to communicate and we want to achieve a certain goal and we need some kind of content for it. So the principle is that you don't have to be a tech writer to care. Um, and we welcome developers and people from all uh, roles uh, in the industry into our community. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about more li later. So like I said, Everyone is a documentarian. So who here has a primary job of a uh, developer? Raise your hand. Okay. Who here interacts officially with documentation in an active way as a part of their job? Okay. Mostly the same, right? So we have a lot of people who may not necessarily be tech writers, but you have to interact with documentation. How do you deal with this, right? Um, so first thing is the content strategy. Uh, asking the right questions ahead of time can save a lot of work and time later. And I'm going to be highly unoriginal uh, and use the format of need to know docs. Uh, that's, the, that's the trick in the last few years, um, in the last quite a few years, uh, where we've gone from comprehensive documentation to useful documentation, right? You don't have to document all the things. We just, just tell me what I need to know right now and save the rest for later, right? There's something like that. Um, so this might help you understand a little bit about the mindset of how maybe technical writers think, and I definitely invite you to ask me and pick my brain about how we think, uh, because I think there's a lot of interesting skill share that we can have in our communities. Um, so I'm going to be highly unoriginal and use the five W questions um, to look at how we can plan uh, a little bit of our content ahead of time. So the first question is, the biggest question is why? Why, uh, the this puts the whole purpose of your documentation under the WIFM test, the what's in it for me test, okay? So what kind of problem am I trying to solve? What kind of goal do I want to achieve with this software, right? So I get a lot of questions about, you know, how do I document what this tool does? And I'm like, maybe you should be asking yourself, how do I document what, I, what you can do with my tool? Not what Mike, ask not what your tool can do for you, but what you can do with this tool, right? So if we change that kind of focus around, then we put ourselves in the user's uh, shoes for a little bit, right? So why would anybody care about what I'm writing? Why would anybody care about what code I'm writing, about the software that I'm actually pushing out there, you know? And uh, sometimes this question can actually reveal a different thing because if I'm documenting, for example, uh, I don't know, couple of dozen workarounds, you know, for troubleshooting, then maybe there's actually a problem with the tool itself that we need to fix. So things like that. If you keep asking these questions, why, 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 until you end up at the very core of what you're trying to achieve, then that's a good, that's the, that's the best start you can have. And theoretically, you know, if you don't have time, you can probably stop there, but always ask yourself why first, okay? Um, and then the next question I want to ask is who? Who are my readers? And that is a parallel question to who are my users, right? So persona-based documentation is quite a common thing that you will see. So you can ask yourself, am I writing for operators? Am I writing for administrators, developers, business analysts, whatever it is? You know, what is the level, for example, of my users? Am I writing for first-time newcomers? Or am I writing for very deep dive advanced experienced people. Um, you can also sometimes split up the who question by location because sometimes, uh, let's say, North America versus Europe versus Asia, they consume information. People consume information in different ways, you know? So if you focus your content to your audience, okay, that's gonna be very useful because you're also gonna be able to give them the information that they need to know and don't confuse them with the stuff they don't need to know, right? The next question I want to ask is, of course, what? What type of information they are likely to be interested in? So, for example, if it's, uh, uh, it could be an installation uh, document, it could be a deployment tutorial, it could be maybe an architecture overview. Uh, so depending on your audience, so if I'm writing, let's say, a white paper for solution architects, you know, that I want to have a lot of fancy diagrams and things that are going to be able, they're going to be able to show the architecture of the product. But if I'm writing, let's say, the first README 
on your GitHub repo for a small tool to be used by you know, core developers of something, then I don't need all this fancy stuff. I can get right down to how do I install? How do I use this? What's the main thing? So what type of information? Um, and at this point, you can already start snooping around at what format of delivery, but that's kind of like coming up later. But depending on who your audience is, what type of information they need to know, you can see, do I need screenshots? Do I need diagrams? Do I need code examples? You know, all sorts of things like that. So you can already start thinking about that. And then the next question is when. When do my readers need to know this information? So how much information, for example, do you need to present in an error message? That's a hard one. It's, it's kind of a one of the million dollar questions that we're dealing with in the documentation world. Is how much information is too much in error messages, let's say embedded help, um, you know, context sensitive, hover tips, you know, the readme of your GitHub repo. There's a lot of different, you know, what, where are my users going to meet this content? And an error message is documentation. Documentation doesn't have to be a book with 500 pages, right? Anytime you have written words to describe something to do with technology, that's documentation. So this is what kind of I'm referring to. Um, so for example, if you're writing reference guides, it's great for searching, let's say, command syntax or functions or stuff like that. But the users are likely to be frustrated by the time that they get there. So as far as if you're looking at software usage cycle, so you have day zero, you know, preparation, prerequisites, installation, you have day one, you know, installation, deployment, testing, and then you have day two, which is actually using the thing. And then, for example, you can have troubleshooting, right? So this is a general flow that a lot of the bigger enterprise-y documentation sets will follow. But there's no reason why you can't plan it like that, even if you know, day zero, day one, and day two are only one topic each. You know, because it'll, anything that you can do to structure your documentation in a way that's going to help the users onboard every time to your project is going to be good for you. Um, and it's, uh, at this point, you can also start thinking about content curation. Curation meaning maintenance of your actual documentation. How often you, do you want to update it? Uh, is it going to be you know, uh, asynchronous publication or is it going to be attached to releases? Somebody asked me actually yesterday over dinner, you know, should, if I'm storing my documentation in the same repository as my code, do I need to have them on the same build you know, to have the code triggered, the documentation build? And I say, not necessarily. You know, if it's there in, in the same repository, then it can really help you. But you don't want to have to tie them in because sometimes, I mean, if I want to fix a typo in the documentation, I don't need to trigger the whole code build for this. And if I'm doing an update in my code base that's just on the back end side and it doesn't actually change user interaction, it doesn't trigger a change in the documentation necessarily. So those things are not necessarily connected. Um, and what else did I wanted to say about this? Oh yeah, how much information do you put in a getting started guide? Okay, this is another very important thing to consider when you're asking when do users need to know information. I'm a big believer that a quick start guide should be 10 or fewer topics uh, or sections and each one of them should be scroll free uh, if it's possible and anything more than that um, is would, would need to go into a different set of documentation. Um, okay, and the last thing that you want to ask yourself is where. Where do I actually deliver this content? Where are my readers likely to consume the documentation that I give them? So if you can have, uh, do you need a static doc site? You know, help.whatever.org. Uh, is a wiki better for you? And uh, maybe you want just the GitHub readme is enough. Maybe you have man pages, maybe you have doc strings that are embedded, error messages, every Every time you publish content to any kind of format, that's that where question. And that's going to affect which information you put in. So, for example, if I have a project that has a documentation page or a website, okay, then you can have more user-oriented information in there. But then the project also has a readme file in the GitHub repo. Um, and so you don't need to put all of that information in the static doc site also in the readme because you have different personas coming in there at a different time requiring different types of information. So if I'm an operator and I'm looking at the static doc site, you know, to figure out how to troubleshoot something, 
I, I will naturally go there rather than the README. But the README, for example, will, uh, is more likely to get hit by contributors, developers, uh, people who need to know different information that the users don't need to know. Um, yes. So if you keep asking yourself these questions, uh, then you will be able, hopefully, to strategize your docs a little bit more uh, and save yourself some work. You know, one of the things that I hear from developers a lot is, oh, documentation is a lot of work. And yes, I mean, but also coding is a lot of work, right? But you have developed, you know, developers have gotten a certain skill set over the years, you know, that makes you write more effectively. Uh, and so have technical writers. So if you can use some of the stuff from, from our field, you know, and we can all improve our own skill sets. Um, so examples. I love examples. I love screenshots. Um, <coughs> sorry. These are just a few projects and things that I've run into over the years that I really like. Uh, I did not include examples of things that I don't like because that will be a whole other talk. Um, and we all have horror stories about, you know, broken documentation and bad documentation. Bad documentation or outdated documentation is worse than no documentation. I will say this now and I will stand by it. Because the time that you waste trying to follow outdated or wrong documentation is much worse than when you're hitting a search and you can't find anything. So please consider this. If you run into your own, I was at the KDE Community Day yesterday, and they were talking about the getting started documentation and how very quickly they ran into outdated material, and they're not sure whether to fix it right away or whether to just open an issue and l fix it later. And I say, well, have you considered hiding or unpublishing, you know, commenting out whatever it is that's outdated, or maybe even putting a note there saying, this thing is missing, we're under construction, <laughs> you know, or something that was that is going to pr you know avoid having the users get confused as they try to follow this something that's totally wrong. Okay. First example I like to point out is the GNOME help. This is uh, from when you go to actually the static doc site. So help.gnome.org. Uh, I'm not talking about the uh, F1 on the desktop. The F1 on the desktop is actually kind of cool because it gives you the user uh, help topics. Because if you're clicking F1 in your graphical desktop, then you're more likely to ask a question about what it is that you're using now. So it's in the context of the desktop. But on the static doc site, they don't know who you are. So the first question they ask is, who are you? OK, it worked for Alice in Wonderland, and it works here too. Um, so if you are a user, you're going to get the same help. It looks a little bit different now, but, uh, but it's basically the same topics. This is the same help that you would get if I was to click F1 in my desktop. OK? And then you only get the information that's relevant to that. If I'm an administrator, then I get only the administrator-specific content. Because you can assume that if you're an administrator, you probably already know how to use the desktop, um, and you are not likely to have questions about that. And if you're a developer, then you go to the development center, and then you have all the cool stuff that the developers need. And you don't even need the administrative stuff, because you ha are likely to have questions or run into trouble with something to do with this. So if you ask who is the, you know, and because it's a static doc site and it's the home page, right? You don't know who's going to get there. So the first thing they did that they do is they focus the persona, OK? So I really like this. Um, <coughs> sorry. Another example I really like is Arch Linux Wiki. Arch users? All right. That's, that's about this, you know, that's a similar ratio to what I get normally. But Arch Linux is a quite, um, very advanced uh, Linux distro. I do not use this because it is way too crazy for me. Uh, but what I've heard when I was talking to people who are Arch users, that the wiki is fantastic, right? Here we go. Uh, and why is it fantastic? Because of this thing, OK? Because it doesn't need to look sexy. You know, you don't need to, you know, it looks just like a basic wiki site, but it has this little search box. And the, uh, the basic assumption is if you're an Arch user, you've tried everything before you went here. And you are already likely to be uh, to know what the more or less the search terms that you want to find, um, and uh, you're already frustrated and very impatient. And so you just want to search for the thing. And this wiki site has a pretty good search function, so it's optimized for searching rather than browsing because it knows who the users are. Okay. Um, the, uh, this is the next example. I used to work on a project called MiniShift. MiniShift is a localized uh, single node uh, containerized OpenShift installation, and it's meant for dev and test. Um, and I was really lucky to be on the ground floor for this. We had about 
a team of about 10 people, and I was embedded in that team as a writer. And uh, I'm, s I'm sorry, you can't really see everything that's in this is the readme for the Minishift uh, GitHub site, okay? And the reason I'm showing this to you is because it's short, okay? And this is what a readme should be, short, because it's a flat file, okay? Even if you have a nice table of content in the top, which you can do, this readme is actually written in ASCII doc, but you can write it in Markdown or whatever it is. GitHub will render this uh, for you. Um, but I have run into so many cases where the readme started short, and then it got longer and longer as the project grew, and it just became a dumping ground for everything, you know? And if you think about the readme of your project as like the foyer or the hallway entrance to your house, you don't want it to be cluttered, okay? Especially because, if we're talking about personas, the readme is likely to be hit by contributors or developers or people who want to actually do stuff in the project. So if you treat the readme like a portal that will take the people to where they need to go. So here you have a little welcome statement. What is this using? You know, getting started. We have a link to the installation. So at this point, we already have a documentation set, and I will use it as a different example. Um, and we have links to the documentation. Uh, we have release notes, and we have the community section. This is something that a lot of projects are missing from their readme, is how do I contribute? Okay, how do I get involved? Who are the people behind this? So please make sure you do not forget to add a community section in your readme. Because if people are going to your GitHub website, they're already probably familiar with something to do with the community, but this is a great way to engage them and draw them into the community as contributors. So the next um, thing I want to talk about is we were talking about error messages. So we had, uh, I got a draft of an error message from one of our developers. Uh, installing additional packages is not supported. For more information, see a link. And I'm like, okay, this is not a very useful error message. Uh, and this thing happens uh, when you're running a VM and you're trying to install packages on the root file system and there's a size limit there and it can actually break your VM. Um, so we were trying to figure out how much information, and this is an error message that you get in the terminal. So you can't write too much, but you have to write something. And when I hear, when I see something that it's not supported, it means I'm actually not technically allowed, something is blocking me. But we can't block the users from installing additional packages. So working in open source, we know people like to break stuff and people don't believe us when we tell them that something is not supported. So we have to actually explain a little bit why, okay? So we were trying to stop them from doing something they're not supposed to do. Um, so we have to figure out, this was a conversation that happened on our GitHub um, on the issue. So we have to figure out why this is unsupported, what are the alternatives, you know? So when you're describing an error or a problem, you know, you cannot do this because reason, this is what you can do instead, work around, if one exists. Right, so this is something that you should be asking yourself as well. So this is what we came up with. Installing additional packages on the root file system might exceed the allocated overlay size, which is something that we made the assumptions that the people who are using this tool, they know what an overlay size is. I didn't know this before, but after they explained it to me, I was like, all right, this is an assumption we can make. Uh, and lock the Minishift VM. Proceed with the installation at your own risk, which is something that y Linux people like to say. So this is kind of a here be dragons, you know? You can do this, but we're not responsible if you break stuff. And then we also put in the link to a new troubleshooting topic where we actually described the mo in more details in case they read this and they still don't believe us, then they can go to the, the website and look at the everything, you know, so we have this is a problem, cause, work around, and if you want to do things. So we've broken down the information in a way that when they see the error message in the terminal, they only get this much information, but it is enough, hopefully, for the most part, to stop them from doing something. And if they want more information, if they really want more information, they can go and look it up somewhere else. So this is a, a kind of an exercise in content breakdown. All right, DevOps. Who likes DevOps? Who likes doing DevOps? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, who likes doing documentation, right? I mean, who likes writing code? Who likes, you know, building stuff? Um, <coughs> these are all things that are necessary in the 
uh, development cycles. So one of the cool things that I like about working in open source and working in these years, okay, is that the documentation uh, area or field has gotten a lot of inspiration and a lot of integration uh, with uh, the developers. Um, and when I started working as a technical writer 10 years ago, we were using FrameMaker, which is a very word processing-y kind of proprietary something or another. And then we went to XML Dita, you know, and that was really cool. And now we don't like XML anymore. <laughs> um, but these are things that are always happening. And a lot of the documentation tooling and process innovations um, are drawing from the engineering world. First thing I want to talk about in there is the integration. And we would love to not have to beat you, okay? We cannot beat you because you write all the tools, <laughs> you know? Um, and I'm not the most technical, technical writer, but, you know, I, like I said, I read a lot of Python. I can't write it. Um, but I can appreciate a good tool if it gets the job done. And at Red Hat, for example, we have a tooling team uh, that they help us build our tool chain and work all that stuff. But I've worked in open source projects where you have to like do a lot of stuff yourself and hitch into the system that uh, from the developers that you're using. So uh, here's an example. Ah, my thing, my box moved. Uh, this box is supposed to be right here. This is the docs folder in the Minishift repo. So docs is code. Love it, right? There's no reason why we shouldn't manage, uh, publish, curate documentation in the same way that we do the code, okay? It is no longer a separate thing. We even use tagged markup files. We parse them, we compile them, we <coughs> deploy them. You know, a lot of the processes, the tooling chains have aligned. So store your docs in the same repo as your code. It's also something that's going to help you if you are making a code change that requires a documentation change. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later in the community spirit part. Um, so you can put your code change and your docs change in the same PR. And you can also, you know, you can basically leverage all of your develop, uh, most of your uh, development tooling and process around your documentation. Um, and then the other thing that I really liked um, is to be able to do hierarchical source content. So in this, in hopefully, you're using this for your code as well, where you have some kind of folder structure where different things in your program are grouped in different ways. Um, so if my, uh, this will basically translate to my table of contents in the doc site that I'm building. So if I have here, you know, in this, in this case it's quite small, so I don't really have subfolders, you know, but for example, a uh, getting started section can have all the topics of getting started. And, you know, uh, then you have different things and all of each of these translates into a page on your static doc site. Um, and Issue tracking is something that I'm, I really support uh, integrating the documentation work into your issue tracking. So make a documentation component, you just flag it, you know, and then you can see in the topics, um, for example, uh, you can also mark things as an easy fix. Uh, if it's a task, if it's a bug, this is all the same kind of philosophy, right? So these are just examples of the things you can do in your open source project right now without even writing any documentation. Just make it a, uh, uh, an equal part of the tasks that you're doing. Um, continuous publication. I remember when we used to make doc CDs. That was a nightmare. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. We just push a button, trigger the Jenkins build, and it's done, right? Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, different tools that you can use to publish information. Uh, if you're writing in Python, you can use Sphinx, ASCII Doctor, MacDocs, uh, Gitbook, you know, you can, GitHub pages will do things for you. If you're using GitLab, you use whatever it is that you use on uh, a self-hosted. Um, and you can manage the release of your documentation in a very similar way to how you do your, uh, your code. Uh, continuous deployments, this is for example from read the docs. You know, every time we merge a PR, triggers a build, updates our, our website, which is basically a documentation website because we use uh, restructured text and Sphinx. Um, and we can even have little previews, you know, staging previews before you merge your PR. So all that stuff is available. Uh, and uh, you can definitely use it. You're welcome to use it. Um, okay, so testing automation is hard for documentation because prose does not compile neatly into binaries. Okay, so this is, this is probably the, the, the hardest part of what I talk about and the part that still 
needs a lot of work. Um, there is work being done around it. So I actually, this so is this the next slide? Yes. Okay. So this is a really cool tool that uh, Mirko, who you've heard speak, there we go, there he is. Uh, he told me about this yesterday, and I was like, I have to put this in the talk. Uh, it's called Shell Doc, and it is a way to test commands in a shell, uh, code blocks in your documentation. So this is, for example, the first part of the readme of this project, but you can actually run this readme through the tool, and it'll test these code blocks. Okay, and this is the output of the tool. So if I understand, I just learned about this yesterday, So, but you are totally welcome to go and check it out. I'm going to share the slides with all the resources. Um, so this is for markdown files. Okay, so if you're using restructured text, ASCII doc, XML, whatever, there are tools for testing code blocks. Okay, but this is a really cool solution. You know, if you have a small project, you can run it locally. You can put it into your build sequence. And it'll literally just validate your code blocks. So if you want to say, you know, hello, and you want to make sure that it prints hello, then it will do that for you in a shell. So it uses, it invokes a shell, um, and then it runs it for you. Um, so this is a cool new thing that's happening. And, you know, the linguistic validation is still a bit hard because when you're writing stuff, uh, grammar and syntax of uh, the English language or whatever language you are translating to um, is also... Uh, quite difficult, but this is, you know, this is one of the cute little tools that we have out there, Hemingway app. Um, the problem is, is that there are tools out there that do that, but a lot of them are not open source. And so in the open source communities, it's still a little bit difficult. But in the last few years, a lot of tech writers have become a lot more technical. So we've been experimenting with a lot of different things. Um, so there's a push that comes, you know, motivation that comes from the tech writers. Uh, also to do this, and because we cross over the skill set between engineering and tech writing, um, then we are able to do more cool things. Um, so, for example, this is uh, called Emender. This is a test automation framework that some of my colleagues at Red Hat Content Services, their tech writers, uh, have been working on. And you basically feed your style guide to it. Um, you know, so things like product names, things like grammatical conventions, you know, passive voice and all sorts of things like that. And it will not fix things for you, but it will uncover problems or questions that you might want to optimize. That's the biggest challenge about, about test automation for, uh, for documentation is, is it's very hard to do the fixes, you know. So it can just show you, I have a problem, but it's not really going to help you fix it, and a lot of it because of the different, you know, US English, UK English, different languages. Um, so this is a cool new thing that they're working on now, and it might be a little bit overkill for your small project, uh, but if you're looking at scaling your project later, and if you actually have a style guide with conventions, then that could be a really nice thing that you can do. Okay. <coughs> I have 10 minutes left. Aha. Uh -huh. Not bad. Um, so the community spirit, I might actually finish a little bit earlier. Um, the community spirit that I talk about is how we can all work together to help our users and our contributors, our community members, how to help them help each other and help all of us, right? So we want to do better things. We want to do more things. We want to increase adoption. Um, and ultimately, all of the awesome gadgets and tools are not going to help us if we don't improve our collaboration. You know, it's never really about the tools. The tools, we can always make more tools. You know, and it doesn't matter which tool you use because humans end up using it. I'm not even going to talk about machine learning and AI. That's let's see, let's see in five years. <laughs> you know, uh, the tools are not using us yet. Okay, um, so <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen there. So in my agile days, you know, that's what we used to say. It's never about the tools, and I still think that way. Um, so, uh, docs are didn't happen. Okay, that's the first thing that um that I would say if I go to an open source project and they ask me how can I improve uh my documentation is the first thing that I would recommend is to make it a requirement okay and I know it sounds a bit like oh you're going to make me write documentation and I'm like no I mean I'm trying to get you to understand that it's just as important to describe what it is that you are making because if your stuff is not visible, if your project is just one out of hundreds and thousands of projects out there, you know, and in today's world, people go online, you know, you can work with people on the other side of the world, you never see them, okay? The written word 
is how you rise above the noise, okay? There's so much stuff out there. You wanna be able to engage. There's a great talk by a good friend of mine, Kelly O'Brien, called Engage or Die, okay? And the, the title is very right, you know, and she talks about the four deaths of engagement, you know, death by disorientation, death by confusion, you know, and I'll, I actually, I'll, I'll share this when I, um, when I share the slides, you know, so I'm looking at it from a slightly different way. Doc, sorry, it didn't happen, okay? I have stickers with this sentence if you want to remind your colleagues so you can get those. Um, so here are some examples of projects that are doing it right. So if you make documentation a uh, required deliverable when you submit patches, so Django project, Linux kernel, OpenStack Foundation, they all require some kind of documentation. Of course, if you, it's for example, in the Linux kernel, right? It's not required for static functions, but it's okay there as well. You know, so there are some changes, patches that you're going to submit that don't really need documentation because they don't, in they don't affect user, user, they don't change behavior, right? But even in sometimes if you're making new things and you have some doc strings or code comments, Let's not forget code comments, um, because self-documented code is code that you wrote recently, um, because in six months you're not going to be able to remember what you did. So that's, but that's a more casual form of documentation, right? Like it doesn't have to have like stylistic conventions. It just has to kind of be there. <laughs> um, but you know, so all of these projects and more have started requiring some kind of documentation along with their code patches. And it's going to be a tricky to get people to get used to it, but it's so important uh, because you're going to thank yourself later for insisting on it. Okay, um, so you want to make documentation a requirement, but you have people who might not know how to start, or you have developers who've never written a piece of documentation, or you have newcomers to your project that you want to encourage them to contribute. Documentation is a great way to get people started on your open source project, okay? A lot of projects um, use documentation bugs as, uh, as easy pickings or low-hanging fruit uh, as a way for people to practice uh, submitting a patch, working in the CI, you know, working with the community, getting familiar with the software, getting familiar with the projects. But you have to help them. So who will document the... the documentarians, right? So who will guard the guards? You gotta help them. So this is something we came up with for NixOS. Uh, most projects um, that, I've, that I know will have some kind of contribution guidelines or some kind of help for how to write the help. <laughs> um, so you wanna put things like, where do I find the documentation? How do I write the topic? Um, so and it doesn't matter if, you're if your project is small. You know, you should have something in there, just like you have contribution guidelines for your code. Uh, again, putting this as an equal thing. Um, templates, templates are awesome. Uh, read the docs, uh, write the docs has a, the readme template. Uh, we've had this up there for I think six or seven years. And this is probably the page that gets the most hits on our website is this readme template. Um, and it's so useful because it's, you just copy and paste it and adapt it. Okay, so I, I talked to someone this morning and they said they haven't actually written a code from scratch in years. You know, they always take bits and pieces, you know. So we do the same thing in documentation. You plagiarize yourself all the time. Um, so a template can be small for a readme, for example, or it can also be something a little bit bigger, uh, which is something that I want to point out. Um, the Red Hat uh, documentation teams have uh, been working on two really cool projects. Uh, one is the modular documentation project, um, and this is for slightly, you can use the information from this project, even for your small project, because we have a reference guide, for example, uh, where it gives you like lots of different tips and tricks on how to write documentation, how to structure a topic, how to structure a documentation repository if you have it, um, you know, anchor names, file names. So like people will come up to me and go, I have this, you know, project, I have no documentation, I have no idea where to start, and I've never done this before. I send them here because they can skim the table of contents and they can figure out the stuff that they need. And thankfully, this was written by writers. So we were trying to think of ways to be friendly to newcomers to this field, right? So you can have the reference guide, you can uh, review it. Or if you want, you could just go to the templates. 
So modular documentation is based on topic-based architecture, so you have concept, procedure, and reference, which is quite a standard way of writing you know, small to big technical documentation. And then you have assemblies, which is basically like a container file with a bunch of includes. Uh, this stuff is an ASCII doc, but if, for example, you go to the raw file, this is a procedure raw file, um, and you have tips and comments on things that you can do, like, you know, this is a procedure, and then you start each, each step with an active verb, you know, do this, uh, include a command, or, you know, so there's a lot of different things that you can use for inspiration. Uh, even if you don't actually use these templates. This is open source, this is public on GitHub, you please use it. Uh, the other project that we have is the Community Collaboration Guide, so Red Hat uh, sponsors and supports a lot of open source projects, uh, and a lot of them need documentation help, and we also then take this documentation, hopefully, sometimes, uh, to, to our enterprise side. So if you have, you know, if you want to link community or upstream documentation with enterprise. We have a lot of different things here. That's more on the community documentation management um, stuff and to see how much documentation you need for your project. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is where you can you meet people and how can you get together and geek out about documentation um, and the things that we, all wi that we want to improve, right? So um, I want to talk about Write the Docs. This is my home. This is my family. It's not an open source project. It's a social network, okay? We have five conferences, uh, Portland, Prague, uh, Vilnius, Cincinnati, and Sydney, okay? And we have uh, more than 40 meetups. We have a Slack. Uh, we have mailing lists. We have newsletters. And this is the place where I turned up in this conference uh, four years ago, and I found my tribe because we have people from all across the board, from all over the world. We have developers, we have writers, we have librarians, scientists, educators, community managers, um, project managers, everybody comes in and we talk about a lot of different things. Um, and you feel free to uh, look it up. Our CFP is open right now for Vilnius and Prague. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of different ways that you can get involved and it's a great learning resource as well. So we share knowledge, we learn about cool new things happening um, and we meet great people. So and it was built from, started on Django and Python communities who are also great for documentation. Um, I want to give a shout out to this project because apparently not, not, I mean obviously not everybody knows, this is a new project from Google. I do not work at Google, but I love what they're doing. So if you know Summer of Code, then this is Season of Docs. And I, I, for some reason I cannot think about this name without thinking about the Rent musical song. Uh, but um, Season of Docs is like Summer of Code but for documentation. So if you have an open source project and you need some documentation help, this is a good chance. They're opening, their applications for open source projects uh, are open this month, and then uh, writers, experienced or new, can look at your project and say, ooh, I want to do something, and then you can mentor them, and they will do the work over the summer. So very similar to Summer of Code, except this is for documentation. This is the first time that they're doing something like this. And I'm really happy to see this happening. The open source project gets some money, the writers get some money, and then you get better documentation. So good shout out for that. Um, and then obviously, there are different ways that you know we can, we can interact. So for example, I am here, I'm giving this talk, I will be at the Red Hat booth, and I will be available for questions, and if you have, if you need some advice on something, or if you're not sure, you know, which markup language should I use for this, or you know, how do I, you know, write a contribution guide? So find me. I am available, and you know, I also do workshops and doc sprints uh, whenever I possibly can. So I really appreciate you coming here and staying here and listening, and welcome to the Documentarian Club. So thank you. <laughs>